Good evening and welcome to our webinar, Coping with the Aftermath of Suicide. I'm Pat Loder, the Executive Director of the Compassionate Friends. This evening all attendees are in a listen-only mode. To ask a question, you will need to type it into your question area on your screen's control panel. To get to the control panel, click on the arrow on the top right side of your screen. I want to direct your attention to the chat box. It will give you a link in the, um, to a handout for tonight's presentation. Our presenters this e evening are two very dear people, Dr. Doug and B.J. Jensen. B.J. is the founder and director of the Internationally Traveling Love in Motion Signing Choir, and she was an international inspirational speaker with You Can Women's Ministries. Dr. Doug is also very much a part of Love in Motion Signing Choir. He earned his doctorate in biblical studies and biblical counseling. The Jensen's are authors of 18 books and producers of 15 DVDs. Both of the Jensen's are award-winning Toastmasters, international speakers, and popular workshop presenters since 1998 at TAPS conferences in Washington, D.C., the Camp Compassionate Friends Regional, National, and International Conferences, Bereaved Parents of the USA Conferences, and Umbrella Ministries Conferences. A heartfelt welcome to both of you. Hello. Hi, Pat. Hi, Pat. I'm BJ. And I'm Doug. We thank you, Pat, and the Compassionate Friends for allowing us to address the topic of coping with the aftermath of suicide. We know firsthand the devastation of suicide because of the suicide of our adult son, Jay. Those of you who are participating in this webinar have probably been personally affected in one way or another by the act of suicide. And for that, we are truly sorry. We share your pain. Experiencing the death of a child of any age or in any manner is excruciating for those of us left behind. Because of the stigma surrounding suicide, coping with the aftermath from this type of death is usually compounded. This webinar will be divided into two parts. After each part, we will address questions and comments about that section. After part two, we will ask you, what things in our talk will be helpful to you in your grief journey? Please jot down anything helpful or any questions as we go. Our son Jay was an enthusiastic, fun-seeking adventurer who grew up loving the water, swimming, and dolphins. He grew to be, become a handsome, intelligent young man who was well-liked. Because of his natural ability with numbers, Jay rose quickly to become the top real estate appraiser for Bank of America in San Diego. He drove a BMW convertible and lived on the prestigious Coronado Island. On the outside, Jay seemed to be living the American dream. But what we didn't realize at the time of his death, on the inside he was battling formidable demons. His life ended tragically in San Diego Bay in 1995 when he lost his battle and chose a permanent solution to his temporary problems. Jay jumped 240 feet off the Coronado Bridge to a watery grave. His death sent waves of sorrow through his stunned family, friends, and co-workers and capsized his dreams to marry and raise a family. As we deeply grieved this horrendous loss that changed our family forever, mm -hmm. we gained insight, compassion, and understanding. Because of our experience, we might be able to help you by sharing some of the knowledge we gained while coping with the aftermath of our son's suicide. Two ways are by educating and equipping. Part one, educating. We can educate ourselves by learning definitions, terminology, and statistics. This is good foundational information to know, starting with the definition of suicide. Suicide is the act of intentionally causing one's own death. Suicide can plague the survivors for weeks, months, or years with feelings of failure, disgrace, humiliation, shame, guilt, dishonor, betrayal, embarrassment, or overwhelming pain and sadness. Not only do we have to cope with the sudden loss and forced separation of a beloved son or daughter, but there's also society's stigma associated with suicide that we have to face. 
we are hit with the stigma of false assumptions, bias, religious judgments, and prejudice about suicide. By definition, a stigma is a mark of disgrace. Society knowingly or unknowingly attaches a stigma to suicide because of ignorance, fear, and misunderstanding. Stigma is a form of prejudice or prejudging, which means to form an opinion without complete knowledge or facts. Unfortunately, when people become uncomfortable with circumstances, they often form opinions and judgments about those things that make them uneasy. This type of prejudice is our enemy. For sure. Yes. Whether consciously or subconsciously, most of us learned early in life that suicidal people must be weak, shameful, sinful, selfish, or that they want to harm others. These claims are usually bogus and perpetuate the stigma, and that detours people who need help from seeking it. Suicide is an act of surrender that is often completed out of despair, a cause of which is frequently attributed to mental illnesses such as depression and other mental disorders. Mental disorders are present in approximately 90% of suicide cases. 90, wow. Yeah. We wouldn't tell someone who had a broken leg that they are weak for seeking help to get it fixed. We wouldn't tell someone who had high blood pressure or cancer that it's shameful they didn't take better care of their body. So they're not entitled to help. And we wouldn't hold back treating someone with diabetes because we thought they were undeserving. We're hoping that someday soon society will realize the brain is a part of our physical body, the same as any other organ. Mentally distressed people should be able to obtain treatment without the stigma that something is disgracefully wrong with them. Stigma has been placed on the parents who have experienced the death of a child to suicide. We found we were often stigmatized, ostracized, traumatized, or penalized by those who blamed us for perceived poor parenting. This scapegoating makes as much sense as blaming parents for children who have a condition like asthma, cerebral palsy, or a heart defect. Mental challenges are part of the human condition, the same as physical challenges. Mm -hmm. Mental illness is like having an elephant in the room that we ignore because we don't want to talk about it. Or maybe the thought of suicide is just too uncomfortable that we simply choose not to deal with it, but we survivors are forced to deal with it. The lack of understanding of suicide today compares with the lack of understanding of alcoholism and addiction 60 years ago. Every era had its stigmas until enough people said, enough. enough. When the death of a child does happen by suicide, we need an anchor to hang on to as our emotions fluctuate like a ship tossed around on unpredictable stormy seas. People choose different anchors to steady themselves when their world spins out of control. Too often, people turn to excessive alcohol, addictive drugs, eating too little or eating too much like I did trying to fill up that empty hole. Or working too much like I often did to escape the unfamiliar and really uncomfortable emotions I had. Mm -hmm. There are so many distractions that can easily become habitual to numb the pain. These things or activities are not helpful in the long run because then you end up with another problem to deal with. We can't ignore it. We can't go over it. We can't go around the pain of grief. We need to meet it head on, feel it, and walk through it. Since Doug and I are Christians, we realized it would be best for us to cling to our faith. Psalm 34, 18 assured me that the Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. And boy, was I crushed in spirit. Mm -hmm. I was also comforted by the verse in Hebrews 6, 19 that says, we have this hope as an anchor for our soul, firm and secure. Yeah, those words comfort me too and, and others as well. Now let's consider terminology associated with suicide. There are appropriate and inappropriate ways to talk about suicide. Outdated ways are committed suicide and victim of suicide. These were coined in an earlier era in reference to the act of suicide because taking one's own life was actually against the law. Even though the laws have changed and suicide is no longer illegal, society's stigma has not changed. 
Many have stopped using the harsh terminology about suicide because of the built-in negative connotations of those words. Yes, more appropriate terminology to use is completed the act of suicide, died by suicide, or death from suicide. But no matter how we say it, the fact is our precious child is gone, and we survivors feel like part of our heart is broken in two. Mm -hmm. We feel segregated and totally alone in our suffering. Yeah, we certainly did. But if we look at the statistics, we see we are not alone. The most recent statistics on suicide in the United States that we could find were from 2010. Those statistics reported there were almost 40,000 intentional deaths that year, and suicide was the tenth wow. leading cause of death. That's amazing. Yeah, and worldwide, approximately one million people die by suicide yearly making it the sixth leading cause of death globally, which means there's two million mothers and fathers who are left behind to deal with the pain. It also means every 32 seconds someone in the world successfully completes the act of suicide. Can you believe that? Every 32 <laughs> seconds? And for every completed suicide, up to 100 suicides were attempted. Even more than that were contemplated. Mm. You know, more people die by suicide than by murder and war combined. All of these statistics may be understated because some suicides are actually disguised as other causes such as accidental overdose or an automobile accident. On the investigative television show 60 Minutes, mm -hmm. we learned the leading cause of death in the military is suicide. In 2012, 349 active duty military took their own life, more people than the total who were killed in military action. 60-minute researchers also reported 22 veterans of military service complete the act of suicide daily. Most military veteran suicides are attributed to PTSD or post-traumatic stress disorder, some form of depression. I could relate to the sign that TCF posted on their Facebook that said, PTSD is not about what's wrong with you, it's about what happened to you. According to the Mayo Clinic, post-traumatic stress disorder is a mental health condition that's triggered by a terrifying event. It not only affects returning veterans, but it happens to some bereaved parents, siblings and grandparents after a traumatic loss by suicide. Right, or any other traumatic loss. That's true. PTSD may be even more exacerbated in the person who discovers the deceased or if the suicide happened in the home. Mayo Clinic says the symptoms may include flashbacks, nightmares, and severe anxiety, as well as uncontrollable thoughts about the event. In hindsight, we're sure BJ suffered from PTSD during her first year of healing because of the constant nightmares and shocking flashbacks she experienced. Yeah, I wasn't even at the scene of Jay dumping off the bridge, but my active imagination replayed that scene over and over and over again that first year of recovery. Yeah, little did any of us know at the time of their deaths, but our children were like soldiers fighting a war with the deadliest opponent of their lives on the battlefield of their mind. Like many other mentally distressed people, our loved ones were heroes who won many raging battles but eventually lost their civil war. Dr. John Maltzberger stated, there is no suffering greater than that which drives people to suicide. Suicide defines the moment in which mental pain exceeds the human capacity to bear it. It represents the abandonment of hope. Mm. There are many different reasons people choose to take their own life. Suicide may be the conclusion of alcohol or drug abuse, relationship or financial problems, bullying, excessive violent TV or video game usage, or the result of access to a firearm. In many cases, three things frequently coexist, mental illness, substance abuse, and misuse of firearms. Whatever the reason a person chose suicide, it was probably their desire to escape from what they perceived to be their extremely painful circumstances. Suicide may have seemed like the answer to our loved ones, but all it leaves is questions for those of us left behind. Approximately one-third of suicides leave behind a note or video goodbye. 
These are usually not complete answers to the question why, just a verification that the person found life too difficult to go on. In her book, Night Falls Fast, Understanding Suicide, Professor K. Redfield Jameson from John Hopkins University writes, suicidal people view the world from a paralyzed perspective in which options are non-existent. They cannot separate the present from the future, and the present is too painful. Hmm. Among famous people who committed suicide throughout history are artist Vincent van Gogh, Sigmund Freud, the father of psychoanalysis, novelist Ernest Hemingway, Somewhere Over the Rainbow singer Judy Garland, San Diego Charger football favorite Junior Seau, and popular singer-actor Whitney Houston. Possibly even Tchaikovsky, Elvis Presley, and Marilyn Monroe, though their drug-related deaths have been inconclusive. People who die by suicide don't necessarily want to end their life. They want to end their pain. Little do they realize that the pain doesn't actually end with their suicide. It's just reassigned to us survivors. We found it interesting that the word suicide or self-inflicted death is not found in the Bible. But there are eight instances reported of people in biblical days dying by their own hand, including Samson, King Saul, King Saul's armor bearer, and Judas Iscariot. These suicides are recorded with no dire condemnation or stigma for the act. Knowing some of these things about suicide provided us with insight. We developed more empathy for our dearly departed loved ones and their struggles, more compassion for ourselves as we travel on this grieving journey, and more sympathy for everyone affected by the death. That concludes part one, so we would be available now for any questions regarding the education portion, definitions, terminology, and statistics. Uh, well, I have some questions here, and um, the one person really wants you to know that that was really good information, and I totally agree with them. Mm -hmm. um, um, I hope it helps. Um, this person wants to know how they can get a list of the quotes that you've given. How oh, they can watch this. Webinar again. <laughs> Watch it again. It will be uh, it will be archived on our website. Um, mm. This this one uh, is I lost a son eighteen months ago from suicide. I found him, and I'm sure I have PTSD. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to heal. You have any um, thoughts there? Well, for me, I didn't realize I had PTSD at the time, but. Time helped that as time went on, and I went to meetings and found out that other people were suffering the same thing, and I got to talk about it and got to share with other people. That, that's what really helped me. I also sought professional help to talk through it, but the, the biggest thing is to talk about it and to, uh, to get that out rather than keep reliving it on the inside. And I think also, BJ, uh, you not realizing you had PTSD, you didn't realize that things were ever going to get better. That's true. And so you yourself had suicidal thoughts. That's true. So it's important to know we have P PTSD so that we can realize there is something we can do about it. We can get professional help. We can go to uh, support meetings. And in that way, things will get better. Things do get better, yes. Mm-hmm. Here's a question, you know, again, I'm getting all of these comments about what great information that you've given us. Um, how do you handle the stigma of suicide? What can I tell people or should I avoid the issue? You know, we're going to get into that in part two. We've got so many suggestions that helped us. Okay. So just stick around. We've, we've got some good information for you. Okay. Um, this one says we have a problem with the word they chose suicide. I don't think when one is in the mental state they can be logical enough to make a choice. What are your thoughts on that? I think that's very true as uh, one of the quotes we used shows that they have a paralyzed perspective. They really can't think through things and all they can think about is the pain that they're in. 
And so it, it's very difficult for a person who's contemplating suicide to reason or think of anything other than ending their pain. Yeah, that gave me so much empathy for our son Jay. I didn't realize what a struggle he was going through and, and um, what a battle he was fighting. So yeah, there's a, there's a lot, of, lot going on on the inside of, of someone with suicide and they can't think clearly. Very good. Um, do you want to proceed with your with the um, your presentation? We'd be happy to. Okay, sure. super. We'll do that. And Thank the you. other thing is, if uh, people still have questions about that first part, they can ask it at the very end of the webinar. Sure. Okay, super. Thank you. Okay, for part two, we're going to equip everyone. We Jensen's felt it was important to equip ourselves with tools to navigate the unfamiliar reality as survivors of our child suicide. The following 12 dynamic actions were recommended to us by other bereaved parents who were further down the road of healing. Our choosing to implement these suggestions for healing helped lessen the pain of our own grief journey. The number one overwhelming suggestion from everyone was find a support group and attend regularly. It is not recommended to isolate or to try to go it alone. We need to integrate. It isn't healthy to hold it all in or hold it all back like some of us are inclined to do. Okay, I admit it. <laughs> <laughs> Holding back the expression of powerful emotions that come with grief causes the energy of those feelings to fester inwardly and that breaks down the immune system, leaving us vulnerable to illness and injury. We encourage everyone to look for a bereavement support group where they can regularly let it all out. I remember going to my first Compassionate Friends meeting and just sitting in the car in the parking lot, reluctant to go inside. Another bereaved parent going to the meeting saw me. I think the grieving face was pretty easy to spot. She knew firsthand the struggle I was going through, and she offered to walk in with me. As uncomfortable as it was for me to admit I even needed the help of a support group, I chose to step out of my zone of discomfort because I knew it would help my healing in the long run. I found it to be a warm and safe environment of people going through many of the same thoughts and feelings. The abundance of tears and stories proved to be healing for me but not for Doug. He just couldn't attend as many meetings as I did. He found them to be too sad, too depressing, and too taxing on his ability to process at that time. I needed to accept and respect his needs and take care of my own. I'm going to repeat that because this is so important. We need to accept and respect our spouse's needs and be sure to take care of our own. I know at first uh, BJ would go to support meetings and even though I couldn't go when she came home she'd give me the five minute uh, version of what happened and I, about five minutes I could understand and take and and work with. I think you learned vicariously that way. Yes I did. Yeah. That, was, that was very helpful for us to do it that way but then later on I could go to meetings. Support groups and conferences have helped thousands of grieving parents the two of us have attended many different venues to support our lifelong journey of coping with the death of a child by suicide. Hopefully, there are many groups available in your area. If not, maybe it's time to start one yourself. Compassionate Friends is the oldest and largest bereavement organization and was founded over 40 years ago in England. And they have the resources and would be happy to help you get started. The support groups that we've been involved with include SOSL, or Survivors of Suicide Loss, the Compassionate Friends for Families and Friends who have experienced the death of a child, TAPS, Tragedy Assistance Program for Survivors of Military Service, the Bereaved Parents of the USA, Grief Share for Any Loss by Death, and Umbrella Ministries for Bereaved Moms. Sharing our similar experiences with others helps us realize we are not alone. Being around other survivors shows we're not going crazy even when it feels like it. We're not crazy. We are grieving. Sadly, 
we needed to distance ourselves from some of our friends and relatives who just didn't understand the depth and length of our mourning. But at support meetings and conferences, we gained a whole new bonus family of other surviving parents who did understand. And boy, that felt good. Yes. Suicide knows no economic, cultural, or religious boundaries. Some famous parents who have experienced the pain of children who died by suicide are Art Linkletter, Mary Tyler Moore, Gregory Peck, Marlon Brando, James R. Ness, and Paul Newman. In an excerpt from a letter written after his son's suicide in April of 2013, Pastor Rick Warren, author of the bestseller A Person Purpose Driven Life, explained to his congregation, only those closest knew that our son Matthew struggled from birth with mental illness, dark holes of depression, and even suicidal thoughts. In spite of America's best doctors, meds, counselors, and prayers for healing, the torture of mental illness never subsided. Today, in a momentary wave of despair, he took his life. My wife Kay and I often marveled at his courage to keep going in spite of the relentless pain. I'll never forget how many years ago, after another approach had failed to give relief, Matthew said, Dad, I know I'm going to heaven. Why can't I just die and end this pain? Mm. But he kept going for another decade. Wow. wow. That goes straight to my heart. Yes. Okay, number two. We need to lessen the power of the word suicide. Most people cringe inwardly at the mention of the word. Do you? I know I do. Mm -hmm. I still feel uncomfortable when people ask how Dick Jay died because I know from experience if I tell them that he died by suicide, they come visibly uncomfortable on the outside, probably judgmental on the inside, and at a complete loss as how to respond. For my own sake, I decided I needed to say the word suicide out loud, repeatedly until the mention of the word no longer held power over me and my thinking. I usually do this in the privacy of my own home when no one's around. So you probably haven't heard me do that, Doug. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it could help you there in the audience. Try it with me by saying suicide, 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 suicide. Whew. Now that we have the uncomfortable out of the way, let's move on to something a bit more comfortable. Number three, implement something that gives you comfort daily. We need to take care of ourselves during this healing process, and that includes doing something that is personally comforting. But comfort comes in different forms to each of us. Being aware of that fact helped me avoid pushing my comfort needs or agenda onto Doug or to anyone else. Holding a cuddly puppy is a joy to me, as it was to our son Jay here with his companion Cabo. But dogs might be an uncomfortable solution to some who would rather hug a cat. Taking a half hour break to read or nap is relaxing to me, but not to Doug. Soothing jazz music to one may be irritating to another. Visiting the grave may be comforting to one of us while the other finds it's too painful to go at all. Knowing and implementing things that give you comfort each day is good. All right, number four, drop expectations. It was unfair of me to expect anyone else to know the depth of our pain. It was also unfair to expect others to remember Jay's birthday or his birth into heaven date. We couldn't expect others to know how we felt on holidays unless we shared our feelings with them. Don't expect anyone to know your journey, especially if they haven't walked your path. No one's a mind reader. It was up to us to drop our expectations of others. And number five, seek a good listener. Close friends or relatives might be helpful, and so can a professional counselor. We don't need someone to try to fix the unfixable. We just need someone to listen to the pain in our heart. More than once, we sought an expert on grief to be a sounding board as we made our way through the complexity and perplexity of grief's expressions. Number six, choose a healthy diet. 
This means eating healthy food regularly and moderately without skipping meals. Our body needs proper nourishment more than ever to cope with the complicated process of grief that has assaulted our body. <laughs> Does chocolate count as healthy? <laughs> ah, all things in moderation. <laughs> grief is a tremendous stressor that breaks down our body's defenses. BJ says, experiencing the death of a child is like having open heart surgery without being anesthetized. Your body needs the correct fuel to recover from the shocking blow of a child's suicide in order to help with the physical healing process. Number seven, enjoy sensible exercise daily. This can be as simple as taking a half hour walk. We had a white German shepherd named Cody at the time of Jay's death. Cody made sure we got out to walk him at least twice a day, whether we wanted to go or not. <laughs> yes. We are actually grateful that he did that because we probably wouldn't have gone otherwise. If you feel up to it, you could go for a swim, hiking, biking, but regular sensible cardiovascular exercise releases the endorphins, which are our body's natural opiates that help us feel a little bit better. Number eight, get plenty of sleep. Know how much sleep your body requires and then get that amount. If you sleep too much or you can't sleep at all, it's good to seek the temporary help of a counselor or sleep therapist. The body needs sleep to rejuvenate itself. Number nine, consider donating time or money toward a cause that your child liked or maybe a nonprofit bereavement organization in your child's name. You could donate toward a memorial fundraiser or even build a memorial of your own like we did. Since Jay loved dolphins, we incorporated a dolphin fountain when we constructed a side yard patio complete with bricks, flowers, trellises, and a glider. One year on Jay's birthday, we had a rock memorial party. We got the idea from the Bible. The Israelites made rock memorials to thank God for all he had done for them. So each person at the party placed a rock in a pile to make a memorial next to the fountain. Each rock represented gratitude to God for the time we had with Jay. Now, years later, we can sit by the bubbling fountain on a starry night and talk about memories of Jay or just simply relax and enjoy. Yes, and we do that. <laughs> Number 10, know that storms will happen. Downpours of grief in the form of tears might engulf you. Sometimes the dark clouds descend predictably, oftentimes unpredictably. A deluge of hopelessness could hit like a tsunami drenching you to the bone. You might experience rough waters of raw emotions, but similar to everything in nature, the unrelenting pain will mercifully subside and become like the gentle waves that ebb and flow lapping the shore. If you know that surprising storms are a part of your grieving process, you can be better prepared to meet them and accept them. Number 11, realize people will say some of the craziest <laughs> things. Unfortunately, there are well-meaning people who it's make true. bizarre and unbelievably hurtful statements. We found we had two choices in dealing with people who were ignorant or insensitive to suicide loss. Number one, steer clear of the clueless, or number two, educate them. In their zest to comfort you, some will offer empty platitudes like, I know how you feel. <laughs> My thought would be, you couldn't possibly know. Some might say, good thing you have other children. Um, but they wouldn't be Jay. You can always have another, right? <laughs> but we don't want another. We want our son back. Or, God must have needed him more. Oh, I hated that when people said that. Really, do they honestly believe that? That is so incredibly ridiculous to say. <laughs> Give me a break. Hmm. A former close friend of mine said some of the most piercing things to me, like, isn't it a shame Jay committed the one unforgivable sin when he took his own life and that he can't go to heaven now? Disbelievingly, I responded by saying, that is so not true and comes from wrong religious beliefs and biblical ignorance. There's no such statement in the Bible. Please get your facts straight before saying things that are so judgmental and hurtful. 
Well, that same friend also said, how could you not know something was wrong with Jay and help him? Huh. Well, you know, it's easy not to know about people's deepest pain or their plans to die by suicide if they choose not to tell you. A tough question for me was, do you blame yourself? Well, of course I blamed myself. We both blamed yes, ourselves at first. Did. After all, it's a parent's role to protect their children from harm. But we realized, finally, that blaming self or each other brought on deep feelings of guilt. Blaming and guilt would only drive us apart, keep us stuck, and still not bring our son back. Some people asked of me, when are you going to get back to being the old you? Well, I politely told them, the former me is gone forever. Presently, I'm wrapped in a protective cocoon while I heal. Someday, I am hoping my new self will emerge even better, stronger, and more compassionate. One of the most awkward questions for us has been, how many children do you have? Yes. We struggled to answer this question that invariably comes up in conversation with new people we meet. We didn't know if we should say, we have one son and let it go at that, or say, we have two sons but one died. But if we said that, the next question would automatically be, well, how did he die? Telling them could be extremely uncomfortable for both sides. If we said we had two sons but one died by suicide, that would be the ultimate conversation stopper. So finally, we decided to say, we have two sons, one that chose to live in heaven and one that chose to live nearby with our three beautiful granddaughters. Even that statement has made some people uncomfortable. But probably the most hurtful of all is when people don't say anything. Many bereaved parents are shunned because people just don't know what to say. A simple, I'm so sorry for your loss, goes a long way to soothe our broken hearts. Saying our child's name or asking about our child's life is soothing music to our ears. But something is better than nothing. Remember, we choose to acknowledge and love our son Jay, even if he's no longer with us. We were not just Jay's parents for as long as he lived. We are his proud parents for as long as we live. And number 12, play positive tapes. Negative tapes may continually want to replay in your mind. You might be anxious that other bad things will happen, or you might be suffering from disturbing flashbacks. These PTSD reactions are common because of the horrible trauma we've experienced. When the two of us realized dwelling on this negative thinking spiraled us into a deep, dark pit of depression, we knew we had to steer away from entertaining gloomy thoughts. We decided we had to be proactive and plan how to respond to negative thinking before hopelessness happened and overtook our attitude. Once again, I turned to my faith and the Bible because reading scripture helped me whenever sorrow threatened to swallow me. I tried to memorize uplifting scripture verses so that positive words would play back at a moment's notice when negativity came into my mind. And that happened just the other night in a dream. Oh, really? Wow. Scripture played back. Any time of the day or night now, my mind will automatically start repeating Philippians 4, 8. Whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable. If anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about these things. Reciting positive scripture helps me avoid being obsessed about the tragic moment Jay died on the battlefield and instead focused on the happy years he lived on the playing field. So Our, true. Are there any questions now about the 12 dynamic actions? Which of the 12 are most helpful to you in the audience? Well, I have a uh, person here who said that she truly appreciates the how many children question and mm. answer that you gave. Mm, good. That is a tough one. 
It is a tough one for all bereaved parents. Yeah. Um, this one is a little tough. It, it, it's suicide passed down in the family. My grandchildren's father died by suicide three days before Christmas. My grandson found his father. And can this cause him to have thoughts that are outside the norm? Both grandchildren are in counseling. What do you think about that, Doug, BJ? What I have heard, Pat, is that suicide is not inherited, but mental illness can be. Mm -hmm. And if you get the problems that are, are mentally wrong taken care of, then you don't have to worry about the other. But sometimes, um, sometimes we just shy away from getting help because of the stigma. Mm -hmm. So we're just hoping that we can encourage people to see a counselor. I mean, we did many times during our healing, and it really makes a huge difference to set us back on the right track of thinking. And that's really the way we turn around the stigma of suicide is by helping those who are struggling mentally to get counseling and to not make it seem that there's anything wrong with them. It's just like VJ said, you know, it's like having a broken arm or you get cancer. You don't sit around thinking, well, should I go to, to see somebody about this? You just go get it taken care of. Mm -hmm. And that's what needs to happen. And as, and as more people do that, then society will start realizing there doesn't need to be a stigma against suicide. So true. Um, this one says, I really like the positive thoughts replacing negative thoughts. That really mm -hmm. was very good. Um, I like that. I'm um, glad that was helpful. Yeah. Do you know of any conferences I can attend over the summer for parents whose child died from suicide? And they'd like to know how long ago did your son die? Our son died 18 years ago. And there are um, conferences you can go to. Uh, obviously, you can look up the Compassionate Friends website and see that there are not only a national conference in Boston this summer, but I'm sure that there's regional conferences coming up within the year if you can't get to Boston. Right. And I know Bereaved Parents is having a conference in Sacramento in July. So there are resources out there. And, and we just highly recommend them. We, we highly suggest people getting to, to these conferences. That's where we found healing. Yeah, very true. And you've got one on both coasts that you mentioned. That's, that's really great. Mm -hmm. um, uh, what are your thoughts about taking antidepressants during the grieving process? Uh, the taking of antidepressants obviously should uh, be done with the counseling of a doctor, first of all. And then I don't have a problem as a counselor with people taking antidepressants so long as they see it as a short-term uh, tool that can be used to help them through the worst of it. But uh, along with saying that, it's important to get with a support group so that the uh, dialogue that takes place with other people and the help that you get in these meetings will start to be stronger and stronger and the need for an antidepressant will lessen so that you can mm -hmm. get off of the antidepressant. You know, I have a, uh, a friend of mine who was suicidal about 10 years ago. He took antidepressants and he really didn't go to meetings. He, he would just, you know, occasionally he'd call me or call other friends. He didn't really work at getting off the antidepressants, and now 10 years later he's still on them. And, and they cause side effects. Any drug we take will eventually cause side effects, so it's important to see taking antidepressants as a short-term solution. I know personally I didn't want to, even though I was in the depth of despair. I, I'm kind of an addictive personality, so I thought, oh my, I don't want to get addicted to drugs. I don't want to do that. I want to feel the pain now, even though it seemed unbearable. I wanted to feel it and work through it because I knew if I did it that way, 
I wouldn't postpone it through drugs. But that's such a, a personal decision for people and their doctor. Very true. Um, a lot of compliments for for this presentation. It, it's absolutely wonderful. So I'm reading through all the compliments and trying to get to your questions. But um, the it. Uh, here's one that says the webinar has been extremely educating, presented very cle clearly and with honesty, and and just wanted you to know that. Um, um, there are a lot of questions uh, about siblings, and um, do you have any books that you would recommend for a, a surviving sibling? Wow, I don't know any off the top of my head. I know there's so many resources out there, though, and uh, going to the internet is a good place to find that. Um, asking at Compassionate Friends any books that they can recommend for siblings. I know at the resource tables and stores that uh, these conferences have, they have a plethora of books that are helpful to people. Yes. Uh uh, there's a company called Centering Corporation, and you can find them on the internet. And they have uh, that's what they have is grief-related books, and that's mm -hmm. a resource that we use. Mm -hmm. um, this one says, um, um, "I lost my brother a month ago today." Mm. Mm. I'm so sorry. Yeah, yeah. me too. Um, uh, do you have any suggestions of support groups for siblings? Again, a sibling question. Definitely the same as, as for any grieving the death of a suicide. Um, survivors of suicide loss is a really good place to start when there's suicide. And I know these conferences have breakout sessions for siblings. So get to a conference if you can. Yeah, and also C compassionate friends is also for siblings as well as for parents. Uh, so any compassionate friends meeting or conference would be helpful. Right. This is this is a interesting question. Did you did you question your faith after your son died? Personally, I didn't, but I have worked with many many people that do, and I think it's okay. To question our faith. It's okay to be angry with God. It's okay to um, not understand what's going on to a sovereign God that's supposed to be in control. We just, we don't get those things. But um, everybody has their own faith journey and I think that um, questioning is a good thing. And I likewise did not question my faith. I questioned myself what I could have done differently. Uh, I questioned you know, why all of this happened. I questioned why Jay didn't make different choices. But I never questioned God because I truly believe that God loves each one of us. And you know, I don't believe that God, uh, God's plan was for Jay to jump off the bridge. But God allows us free will. And so uh, you know, Jay was in a lot of pain, obviously, that we didn't know about and made that choice. And so we just accept that that's what Jay did for himself, and we accept that uh, God loves him and still cherishes him, mm -hmm. as we do. Right. Um, this person likes the idea of playing positive tapes. Uh, he found himself watching Hallmark Christmas movies because <laughs> he knew they had happy endings. Oh, that's yes. great. That's a yes. great great reason yeah, yeah. We, we do that too we watch a lot of the Hallmark shows because uh, as I tell BJ they're usually predictable but they always make you feel good <laughs> that's right um, uh, go ahead did you want to say something BJ I was going to say we too have a choice we can look for the negative and we'll find it or we can look for the positive and there's plenty of that we can be thankful for what we still do have rather than focused on what we've lost or what we don't have. It's our choice. That's very, very true. 
no matter how your your child died. Um, this one says, we found that although we were both struggling with our own grief, we couldn't fix each other. We had to respect where each other was at. Our therapist said it was like our grief was like a fountain, and he wanted to turn off my faucet, tears, <laughs> and mm -hmm. I wanted to open his faucet up. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. neither of us could touch each other's faucet. Yet we learned in getting through this together, we had actually become closer, having gone through something like this together. Mm -hmm. Yet it was so hard watching each other go through mm -hmm. the pain. Yes. So, so the, true. Yes, mm -hmm. that's, that's said very well. And one of the things that BJ and I did right after Jay died was we didn't want our marriage to break up over the loss. And so we made an agreement that we, we weren't going to let that happen, that we would support each other and however the other person chose to grieve, if they chose to grieve a little or a lot, if they chose to wail every night and every morning when she woke up. That would be me. I was there to hold her. Um, BJ would be understanding of me if I didn't seem to cry, if I didn't seem to be grieving. I was grieving on the inside, but she couldn't see it. Yeah, we just... We both grieve so differently that we had to respect and accept the differences. Neither one was better. They were just different. Right. Um, this person asked, uh, I've been presented with the question, how to handle my new identity as a mother of a child who has, who has died by suicide. How, how do you handle your new identity? One day at a time. Mm -hmm. One day at a time. Yes. And, and it is hard because when you say the word mom, you, of course, associate that with having a child. And what we try to express in our webinar is that uh, we still have a child. We still have Jay. We still have all those memories. We still have uh, the relationship. It's just uh, different. It's different, and it's, we're separated for a period of time. But in our faith, we believe that we'll be reunited. And uh, for those who uh, are struggling with identity, remember, you're, you're still the mom. You're still the dad. Mm -hmm. uh, you still love your child. And you can continue to have uh, that relationship with them in, yeah. in memories. I don't think any of us that have experienced the death of a child think we had them long enough. It's, we've been separated much sooner than we wanted. And it's upset the natural order of things when parents are supposed to die before children. So it really upsets our thinking for quite a while. Mm -hmm. um, this, this question is, um, I just lost my son a little over two months ago. I'm very sorry, mm -hmm. Sherry. Um, I still uh, having problems with acceptance and denial. I don't go mm -hmm. anywhere because of all the reminders of him. I break mm -hmm. down and cry everywhere. Any help on how to cope back into the world? Wow. I went through the same thing. I'm just, you know, so sorry for your loss. And it takes time. Don't be in a hurry. Just, you know, listen to your body and what it's telling you to do and what it's telling you not to do. And um, be gentle on yourself. You've just had major surgery. So it's going to take quite a bit of time to heal. Okay. And if you're not in a support group, make sure you get uh, to a support group or at least have a very close friend or relative that you can talk with and express your feelings about. And um, <coughs> also, um, oh, sorry, lost my train of thought. Uh -huh. um, uh, also, oh, I will remember, when uh, we first had our loss, we knew that going out into public was going to be difficult and that certain things would come up and that we would um, need to like my emotions. <laughs> yes, specifically Losing. BJ's emotions. Losing it. And we agreed that if we were any place and it just became too difficult, 
either one of us could say, I need to leave, and we would immediately leave. So there will be situations where you need to leave right away. Just accept that. Mm -hmm. But otherwise, you know, getting out to take a walk, you, you need to keep trying to get out into the world again as your emotions will let you. Little at a time. Yes. Mm -hmm. So would you like us to wrap up now, Pat? There is just one thing that somebody reminded me of in, in the question pane, and I'd like to mention this. Um, okay. Compassionate Friends has an online support group for those whose loved ones may have taken his or her own life. Um, mm -hmm. It's Tuesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern Time, and parents and siblings are allowed to attend. And you can go to the Compassionate Friends website to um, find more information on. It's called the Online Support Community. So, yeah, sure, go ahead. Right. I'm sorry to interrupt, but go ahead. No problem. In conclusion, suicide is the only death which is self-inflicted, meaning it is the only death by choice. As parents who have spent a lifetime shielding, providing for, teaching, and encouraging our child, it is the ultimate crushing blow, and we are plagued by endless questions of why. Why couldn't he find happiness? Why could she not escape the depression? Why couldn't we help him? Why didn't we see this coming? For the most part, answers to why are unanswerable. Pursuing the why results in disappointment and frustration. Answers cannot change the outcome of our ch children's choices, nor bring them back. Remember, we did the best we could to raise our children. They did the best they could to fight their demons. We all did the best we could with the knowledge we had at the time. Peace comes with accepting those facts. We appreciate how other bereaved parents have been there to help us as we traveled through that long, dark tunnel. When they encouraged us to be brave, a smile of remembrance came to our faces. We both thought, yes, we could be brave, as brave as we remember Jay being at a very early age. Outrageously brave at times. <laughs> okay. Because of our son's untimely death by suicide, We've gone on to find renewed meaning and purpose. Our lives have taken a whole new direction. But Doug went on to earn his doctorate in biblical studies and biblical counseling to be of assistance in the field of grieving. It's a privilege for us to walk beside and encourage other parents who have experienced the death of a child, writing our book, Finding Hope After the Devastating Loss of Beloved Children, is another way we have reached out to help others. Let's review the 12 dynamic actions that can help us cope with the aftermath of suicide. They are find a support group, lessen the power of the word suicide, implement what's comfortable to you. Drop expectations, seek a good listener, and number six, choose a healthy diet. Number seven, enjoy sensible exercise. Eight, get plenty of sleep. And nine, consider a memorial. Number ten, know that storms will happen. Eleven, realize people will say the craziest things. And number twelve, play positive tapes. Pat, do our listeners have any other questions or comments before no, we conclude? That'll wrap it up for this evening since we're running out of time. But I want to thank you so much for well, we this hope, wonderful, wonderful presentation. We hope in the memory of our beloved son Jay that people have heard something today that will support them on their healing journey and help them cope with the aftermath of suicide. Very handsome guy there. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for joining us. God bless. Yes. This webinar has been recorded and will be archived after it's processed on the Compassionate Friends website, www.compassionatefriends.org. Watch the Compassionate Friends website for the dates of upcoming webinars. When you visit TCF's website, you will find a chapter locator and a host of grief-related materials. You will also find links to our Facebook and Twitter pages. Doug and BJ, thank you so much for being with us this evening. Good night all and be well. <laughs>